Before we get started, we think we should let it be known that we love Jimmy Wang Yu as an actor and a director. In these roles, he was a badass. Someone who knew just how to get the best out of his lead actor himself, and someone who also knew what his limitations were and always found a way to work around them. As a human being, however, he may have left a lot to be desired. Links to organised crime, rumours of domestic abuse, and being on trial for murder, of which he was eventually acquitted, the life of Jimmy Wang Yu seems to have been as far away from the White Knight heroes he played on screen as humanly possible. Now usually we wouldn't start any video like this but we feel that as long as you know the quote unquote facts of Jimmy Wang Yu's life outside the silver screen you can make up your mind before we go any further if you want to hear why we consider the master of the flying guillotine to be essential kung fu viewing. Still here? Good, then let's begin. At the end of the one-armed boxer, the, uh, one-armed boxer defeats the big bad and his hired henchmen who end up very, very dead. Unfortunately for old one arm, the two hired goons were disciples of a man known as the master of the flying guillotine. Annoyed as all hell, he vows revenge, yea revenge, and off he sets to settle the score, but not before he blows up the shack he's living in. He does this by throwing what looks like exploding blueberries into the place and boom, explosions and fire ensue. This is something he does whenever the need arises, which is a lot more than you would think would happen in feudal China, but if I was as blind as a bat's arse in a sling, then I think I'd use whatever trick I had at my disposal. For someone who can't see, he is deadly beyond belief. He proves this at the start of the movie when he decapitates a series of stationary targets and pins a chicken to the side of his house, but it's not like he comes up against moving targets and has any trouble removing the heads from the shoulders. He proves this throughout the entire runtime of the Master of the Flying Guillotine by chopping the tops off of anyone who claims to be the one-armed boxer, as some bum does in a restaurant to get out of paying the bill, or just decapitating anyone unfortunate enough to have lost an appendage. He even goes as far as to claim that he will kill every one-armed man in China until his revenge is satisfied. He makes this statement during a tournament that is being held to find out who is the deadliest fighter around. He does this by cutting a fighter's head off and then warning everyone he's going to carry on doing what he's doing until he gets what he wants. The fighting tournament itself is probably one of the best parts of the Master of the Flying Guillotine. It pits martial artists from around the globe, some of whom are definitely in blackface, in a Mortal Kombat style fight to the death. There are some really good contrasting styles involved. Well, as contrasting as the confines of a 1970s kung fu flick can be. And there is, of course, the quote-unquote Indian fighter who can make his arms stretch to ridiculous lengths so he can throttle the ever-loving Jesus out of his opponents. Seriously, this guy is one breath of fireball away from Street Fighter's Dalsim. If this character wasn't an influence when they created Dalsim, we're made of cheese. But if you can get over the horrible stereotypes and squeaky shoes from Kung Pao being a distraction, then you will find enough high kicks and backflips to keep you more than entertained. The best part of the Master of the Flying Guillotine, outside of the Flying Guillotine, is the pacing of the story. It is a slow burn that looks to build suspense towards the showdown between the Master and the One-Armed Boxer, and it does it very well. We read a quote-unquote fans review of the film that slagged it off, claiming that anything that wasn't made by the Shaw Brothers in the 1970s was terrible. That person is an idiot and completely misses the point of a movie about a hat that can cut off heads whilst it's being wielded by someone with the vision of Stevie Wonder. It would have been easy to have Jimmy Wang Yu fight his way through wave after wave of bad guys until he meets the end of level boss, but having him do little outside of flashbacks to the previous films for the first three quarters of the Master of the Flying Guillotine is a stroke of genius. For example, he has to be goaded into a fight by Dalsim, who sets fire to an important picture of worship, before he gets mad enough to finally kick some ass. When he does finally catch up with the Master of the Flying Guillotine, their battle is pretty damn decent. Having managed to murder the hell out of everyone the Master has sent after him, their ultimate confrontation takes place in an Undertaker's, and sees the one-armed boxer use as many tricks as he can, including literally being light enough on his feet to run up a wall and stand on the ceiling to bring the Master down. There is so much to not just like, but to love about the Master of the Flying Guillotine that it's difficult to know where to start. We love the fact that Jimmy Wang Yu knew his limitations and built a career around them. We love the fact that a blind man has to carry the bulk of the ass kicking in this movie because its lead actor couldn't do so. Hell, we even love the fact that the dubbed version is only dubbed during the important bits of plot, and for the rest of it, they just thought, sod it, let's not bother. But what we love the most about the Master of the Flying Guillotine is that in an era where most of these films had any form of plot left on the cutting room floor, Floor to focus on the action, the Master of the Flying Guillotine is still intact and allowed to tell a tale that will have you hope from the first minute to the last. But what do you think? 
Have you seen Master of the Flying Guillotine? Do you agree with it being essential Kung Fu viewing? Sound off in the comments section and let us know.